Remain standing and find in Mark chapter 2. I'll be moving off my script, my plan for the word this morning. And we'll be preaching that next Sunday morning. In addition, in addition, watch this announcement. Catch this. Because of uh, the amount of people whose attendance has been affected today and because of the, the snow we're having right now, we will not be having service tonight. The cantata, the preparation, the program of our choir will be next Sunday morning. And then I will preach, even if it's abbreviated form, the word that God put in my heart. But the Lord just dropped in my spirit that before, before we leave today, he's going to heal somebody. And I'm not sure who it's going to be. It's going to be me and at least one more. I mean, if it's going to heal anybody. Might as well be me. I love what Mark said. This church, not because of Kathy and me, um, but because of you and your faith, lives are being touched. Uh, lives are being changed. Uh, two or three or four miracles have already happened since we said, you know, we're going to end December in, in a, a season of the supernatural. Draw your attention to Mark. Did everybody get that, everybody get that announcement about the, the schedule of change, okay? Uh, we will be here Wednesday night, and I um, appreciate you being here today. So take the evening off. Be praying for us, and we do love all of you very much, very much. And we appreciate your love. Appreciate three of you who love me back, and I, that means a lot. It's more than I ever deserved. I love the Dave Ramsey line when they call in. How you doing, Dave? He says, better than I deserve. And I feel that way, don't you? Better than I deserve. Why don't I, I, how many know you do, you're doing a lot better than you deserve? Come on now. Why don't you just give a Lord a praise about that right there? You are doing a lot better than you ever deserve. Mark chapter 2, and again, he entered Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. And I just want to drop in there and say, when Jesus is in the house, people will hear about it. Immediately, many gathered together, so there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. I can't wait till that happens. Amen. And he preached the word to them. And he preached the word to them. Then they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. Verse 4. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof, the roof, the roof, <laughs> where he was. How many say ru roof? Roof. What's another way of rough? Roof. Not as not as roofy. The roof. The roof. How many say roof? So, when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was laying. Verse 5, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to him, Sons, son, your sins are forgiven. What if we had faith that could tear that roof off? I wonder what Jesus would say to us. The guy got a double portion. He got his sins forgiven. He got out of that bed. God, I'm asking you now in the authority of the name that's highly exalted. Pray with me right now, church. Come on, why don't you just cry out? Let me, let me hear us in unity. Come on, come on. Let's pray like we need a miracle. Oh, my soul, my 
All of you in this front row, you need to be crying out. You need to be exercising your faith right now. Lift up your voice right here, right now. Right here and now. You're going to have hands laid on you in just a moment. And God will respond. Woo. Hallelujah. 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 Let's go, church. Come on, let's go. It's prayer time. Come on. Touch him. Touch him. Reach out. Oh, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, God. Let's lift up believing hands right now. Father, we believe you. Father, we believe you. Father, we trust you. Father, we are acknowledging you in the name of Jesus. Well, why don't we clap a mighty offering of praise and shout of victory today. Hallelujah. You know, as you're seated today, I want to just tell you that God is always looking for one thing, and he's always looking for faith. There's never been a moment when God was not interested in faith. There's never been a moment when God dismissed faith as though it was a secondary option. There's never been a moment, hear me, church, that faith in action did not touch the heart of God and move God to respond. God responds to our faith. We think he responds to our need. We think if I'm desperate enough, if, I, if I'm concerned enough, if I hurt enough, then that will capture his heart. But God responds to someone in spite of their need who will operate and step out in faith. Listen, you and I need to make a connect right here. I'm going to preach the word of God for a moment. Jesus preached the word of God, and when the word of God is preached, signs and wonders will follow. And so please don't zone out on what I'm trying to tell you. James taught us. You show me your faith, and I'll show you works. Faith without works is dead. Just a second ago, and I'm not bringing an attack. I'm not even um, trying to make anyone feel bad. But, but, but just, just, let's reason together about this. Let's talk about faith being seen by works. Let's minister this reality that we, the, the messages of faith in the Bible that bring attraction to us are those people who had everything stacked against them, but they pressed in. And the woman with the issue of blood. You know, we, you know, it's interesting, God left her name out because she probably would have been a hero with Abraham, Moses, because this gal with the issue of blood for 12 years is quite heroic indeed because she was weak, she was anemic, she had nothing left, but the word specifically says she heard Jesus, just like these folks in Capernaum, heard Jesus in the house, and so she said, you know what I'm going to do? I heard he was there. I heard he was in the crowd, and, I, and I'm pressing in. You know, it was hard for a woman to even get near any man, much less Jesus, because he was surrounded by this um, secret service group called the Disciples. Peter probably headed up the whole team, and it was his job to serve as the bodyguard. Whether he, he was assigned that or not, I'm sure it was self-imposed. I will protect Jesus from the riffraff. And when he saw this little woman, you know, trying to push in, I'm sure she had to really work through and negotiate through that crowd. And that's why we're attracted to her, because she said, 
I'm going to touch his hem, the hem of his garment. I'm going to do that. And everyone can try to stop me. Everyone can come against me. And everyone can tell me I got no business doing it. But they're not in my shoes. I am sick. I'm afflicted. I'm out of money. I'm out of hope. I spent everything I've had. And I've, do, I've gone to every doctor. And I'm growing worse. Guess what? I'm going to touch him. Woo, come on, somebody. And it was the same attitude of these four friends who brought this man on a bed and they said, look, we're coming by in the morning. We know Jesus is in town and we're going to go where he's at. He's been touching. He's been healing everywhere he's going. He's ministering. He's laying on hands and people are being healed. And, and you know what we're going to do? We're going to get you to Jesus. So I can see the excitement in their heart. Each grab a corner of that mat and they start going and they start going where they heard Jesus was. And all of a sudden they start seeing the crowd had gathered. They tried to bump their way through. No one would let them in. The house itself was completely filled and all around the house was completely surrounded. Most of the people there that gathered probably didn't even see Jesus. They probably couldn't get him in their vision, but they could hear him. And so Jesus is in there, crowded, people all around him, and he's preaching the word, and he's going to be laying hands on people, and he's going to make everyone that's there whole. Now, these friends work their way into this attitude that says, you know what? We came here for Jesus to touch him, and that's what, that's what it's going to happen. I want you to understand today that you and I have created a culture because of the culture we live in where we never have to um, do much we just everything in our world today is about ease and it's about comfortability and it's about convenience you don't have to work up a sweat you don't have to go the extra mile every you know you basically hold your world in your pocket and how many of you, many of you have learned to live life one-handed because in the other hand, you almost have like a super glued your phone. Whenever you, I, I mean, you, you count the times people walk around like this. They're driving, they're eating, they're eating with one hand, they're walking around like this. It's in their hand, it's got, they got something in it, and it's their phone. Who's got a phone on them real quick? What kind of question is that? Give me, let me just see one. Um. You know, people are just walking around like this. Am I telling the truth? And you do it. You do it. And you know, your whole world's right there. You can push a button and talk to somebody in the North Pole. You can push a button and you know what the weather is. You know what the sports score is. You know what your Facebook page status is. You know emails. You know um, who's calling you, what's calling you. You know uh, anything. In this, in, you want to know the score. It's right there. You want to know um, what's going on. You can push a button. And if someone else has the same contraption, you can push a button and talk to them, and they can see you, and you can see them. And what sells, and people don't mind paying high dollars if it's going to be easy. Watch, watch this. A moment ago, again, not attacking anybody, I said, I said, well, let's lift our hands. Let's, you know, and I, I opened my eyes because pastors have to watch the sheep. That's my job. I watch you. And some of you could not raise your hand. It was asking too much. <laughs> oh, me. Uh, let's, let's cry out. Some of you want a miracle. You could even vocalize your cry. Now again, again, I'm not at you. I'm not attacking you. But where we have gone in the church is a far cry from four men saying, well, you know what? We brought him here to be touched, and if we got to get up on this roof, and we got to tear it apart and lower him down, it's a far cry from where we've gone to a little woman out of energy, out of steam, out of blood, out of hope, out of money, saying, I'm going to touch him. We've gone a long way, but we've gone the wrong direction. There is very little desperation. There is very little crying out. There is very little panic that we need to exercise that says faith without works is dead. Unglue this from my hand. God desires us to step out in faith, and faith without action is just talk. He requires of his people some sense that says, 
If I will touch you, if I will cry out, if I will do whatever it takes, if I will get up on the roof and I will, I will make some way, if I will do whatever I can, you will do what you can. Come on now. God will reach out and meet you more than halfway, but faith always says, God, I'm coming after you. I'm moving into you. Nothing, nothing will stop me. I just am amazed at how quickly we take no for an answer anymore. When we're talking about, let's pray, let's believe, and the voice says, it's not happening. Oh, you're right, it's not happening. And let's just call out to God. Let's just touch God. Let's just move into him. Let's get hungry for him. Let desperation and hunger rise. Let's tarry. Let's seek his face. And let's get, let's get passionate. And I heard someone preach a good word about enthusiastic. Let's get a little enthusiasm. Let's get a little excitement about the fact that God is a mighty, awesome, powerful, great, and wonderful, and amazing God. Hallelujah. We ought to praise him for that. God requires faith. As much as you need your miracle, as much as you need God to touch you, he needs you to touch him. As much as you need something from God, he needs something from you. And what he needs from you is faith. And he knows he has your faith when you put some oomph behind it, when you put some effort behind it, when you are willing to say, God, this is a a chance that I have to come in your presence to allow you to touch my life and nothing whatsoever will stand between me and you. Can you jump to your feet, church, this morning and let God know that's going to be your attitude. There will be nothing. Come on, let him know. Let him know. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Nothing will come between us. You know, I'm tired, I, I, I get a little weary as you're seated of us having the nice try, we'll try again later attitude. You know, those guys, there was no registered, there was no online, there was no website of Jesus' itinerary. He was in Capernaum that day. For all they knew, he would never come back to Capernaum. They couldn't get in a bus, they couldn't get in a car. If he, if he traveled you know, 10, 15, 20 miles, 30 miles, they may never see him again. All they knew was there was this healer who was in the house and he would make people whole. Sick people would come and sick people who couldn't walk would come and they'd be laying on their bed and Jesus would lay, and, and lay hands on them. All of a sudden they walk carrying their bed. And when they heard that news that he was in their town, he says, they all go, uh, let's pick a name. Shout out a favorite guy's name. Joe. Let's, let's say, hey, and they're all talking, and they said, do you hear about the fact that Jesus was in this house? He's in our town. He's in this house a few blocks over, and he is healing people that can't walk. They're coming in on their bed, and he's touching them, and they're leaving, carrying their bed. I think that's something Joe would be interested in, don't you? And Bob and Pete and Harry and Dylan all said, um, yeah. Joe could use that. Aren't you glad? I know Joe's glad that when they got there and they saw the crowd, they saw the house filled, they didn't say, well, we tried. We gave it our best effort. Come on. We, well, we, we, you know, we said, we said we'd bring you. It's not our fault. It's not, you don't get mad at us, Joe. <laughs> We're doing our part here. Don't, we said we'd bring you, and we done brought you, and now we can't get in there. You know, we tried. We, get, we'll just, we just tried. If there's a next time, you know, we'll, and it works out, and we're not too busy, we'll try again. I'm preaching good on a snowy day. I'm not going to tell you a lie right there. And, and uh, we're, just, we're just, well, you know, we, we, we gave it our best shot. What, what, what can you say? What can you say? And you know, that's the attitude the church has. All right, we'll just go ahead. We'll just, we'll, you know, we'll just try, you know, okay. 
you know, praise God, there you go. I will give it a shot, you know. And there has to be this connection that says, God, I am stepping in. God, I am making a connection right now. God, I am going to receive from you. Hallelujah. Woo, hallelujah. Uh, you know, I, I proclaim the word, but pro proclamation of the word. When Jesus preached the word there, you saw where he says he preached the word. Listen, proclamation of the word, and this is where we fail many times in the church, is, is not just teaching or preaching. Proclamation of the word is not just verbal. It's not just someone with a microphone talking about the word. Proclaiming the word is not only verbal, but it is visible. We don't only proclaim God's word by what we say, but by what we do. Hallelujah. We don't only preach God's word through sermons and messages and teaching and all of the different ways that we speak God's word. God's word being proclaimed, Pastor Dylan, is not just by the words that we speak, but by the actions we invoke. Hallelujah! Whew. Someone lift your voice in the Holy Ghost right now. Come on, let's build up our faith. Let's build it up. Let's build it up. Hallelujah. God, in a moment, I'm going to lay hands on the sick, and they're going to recover. In a moment, I'm going to lay hands on the sick, and they're going to be whole. We're going to lay hands on them, and they're going to receive their health. And i got a question for us. What is standing between you and Jesus? What is standing between you and your miracle? What is there that you've got to put your hands on? If it was a roof like today, they would have had to have probably some type of a roof removing shovel. They would have had to have a crowbar. They would have had to have uh, some kind of cat's claw, something to get in the nails. They'd have a, a hammer, uh, perhaps a, a, a sawzall, and, and they would have, they would have had to you know bring some tools up. And it would be like me preaching right now in that section right there. You'll see a saw come. <laughs> And I'm thinking, you know what? That, you know, I can get distracted. I'm not, I'm not Jesus. I'm sure Jesus didn't. I'm, here, I'm sure he didn't bother him a bit. Dust was flying and all that stuff. He just kept preaching. But you know me, I get distracted when I see somebody out there talking and kids are, you know, whatever. And, and I, I get distracted when someone gets up and I'm thinking, well, what did I say now? They got up awful hurry. Either they got to go real bad or they got to go real bad. You know, I didn't know. And I... How many believe me that I have to say, what in the world is going on up there? And we'd all be looking. Sawdust would be for also a little planks start coming in, little pieces of uh, uh, shingles start coming down. And then you look up and you see these faces. There's a hole and you see these big old faces going. Four of them pop, 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 pop. And they're high fiving each other. There's a mess on the floor. And then we're watching and we're observing, and then four ropes start coming down. Now, they didn't have shingles like we did. They didn't have wood like we did. They probably had some kind of uh, clay tile or something that, that they'd kept. You know, it was a desert. They didn't need to protect from the snow, but they had to protect from the heat. They had to keep the elements out. There's probably, whatever the roof looked like, there was a mess. Now, let me just make this clear. We want to package our miracle in some cute little, dainty, wonderful little controlled package. But some of you are not going to get your miracle until you get over the mess that may have to happen. Lord, I know. I have to always tell them how good preaching they're getting. They're not used to it. They're not getting it. But let me just tell you, that's a good word right there. And some of you just think, well, I'm not going to get anything because I'm not interested in a mess. God may have to mess you up. May ha God just may have to get you all to, off of your pride and off of your, uh, you know, your ego trip that, that you think, okay, I'm going to tell you how to do it. You're not going to tell God how to do a miracle. That's up to him. What God wants is your faith. He wants your action. He wants your belief. And he wants you to be willing to tear whatever is in your way off. Now, let me tell you something. There's something standing in our way. Mark talked about uh, sowing and reaping. You know, you cannot reap if you don't sow. And you cannot get anything from a God that you disregard every other week or every other month 
or every the year as long as things are hunky-dory and you don't call on him and you're not praying and you're not studying and you're not faithful and all of a sudden something happens and oh okay here I come I mean God gets that but the truth is God responds to someone that wants his heart more than what's in his hand and he wants someone that just wants to be with him more if he never does a miracle for me will I still serve him if he never heals me will I still love him you know God has a will and his first will is that you go to heaven and he would rather have you go to heaven Jesus said it with with one arm with one eye with one leg halt and maim than to enter eternal hell whole and here's what Kathy as she did not know what I was about to say and to some extent I didn't either but here's what I knew I was going to be bringing up there is a dual purpose for your miracle it is not just for you there was one reason that Jesus did miracles, and there's a reason he does miracles today. So people will be attracted and drawn to him, and people will be impressed by his power, and they'll get their hearts right with God. And if we think, well, do you really honestly think that God sit up there and saying, well, I'm going to touch him, you know, I'm going to touch him, so they just can feel better, and they can just go on their merry way, and, you know, um, well, I don't, I'm just going to touch him because, you know, I'm just going to heal him. And I really, you know, if they never tell anybody, I'm fine with that. God's not fine with that. What God is fine with is when you begin to testify, because I'm convinced there are people who didn't get their miracle because they were too inhibited to tell anybody, and they lost the miracle because they were too embarrassed to tell anybody. But when you get healed, you need to, you know, there would be only one purpose for social media. Only one. Only one. If you're a Christian, and this isn't your purpose, get off of it. A point is, if you're not telling everybody about Jesus, nobody cares about what you had for lunch. I'm just telling you. You're not that interesting. You live under a delusion where they care about if your socks are black or blue. I'm serious. I don't care about it, and I love you more than them. But if you, if you could use that media, and there are guys that do it, there are people that do it, and everything is about Jesus. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. I love Jesus. Look what the Lord has done. He healed my body. He touched my mind. He saved me just in time. Hey, come on now. Woohoo! Hallelujah. God will be praised. So today, there's going to be two things going to happen. When you get hands laid on you, you're going to be healed for your sake and for his sake. Can you build your faith up right now and give the Lord a mighty shout? Come on now. <laughs> Hallelujah. I've always found it interesting that Jesus dealt with the worst problem before the secondary problem. The fact that this man was, this fa the fact this man was lame and was on a bed was a problem, but it wasn't the problem. It mattered to Jesus, of course. But it didn't matter near as much about the first thing he dealt with. Before he got the guy off the bed, he said, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now listen to me. God is not interested in making a home that's dysfunctional, that's broke down, that needs a foundation, a new foundation, and putting up cute little curtains. And when we have sin in our heart, and we ask God to heal us, touch our finances, do all those things, we're saying, God... You know, I just want a facelift. I'm not interested in a new foundation. God always talks about the foundation. God always talks about the real issue. It's sin. And what, what, is, what is not faith is sin. And what we are not to be doing and we do it, it's sin. And when we know we should do good, according to James 4 and 17, and we don't do it, it's sin. Somewhere... There is a wall, there is a roof, there is an obstacle. There is something that is prohibitive of us getting our miracle. And we need to deal with that. And I'm looking today and I'm saying to some of you, God really has great things all cooked up for you. I mean, it's amazing. It's a, it's a, a design, it's a destiny, it's a plan that, you know, I've never met anyone that says, you know, I want to grow up and be unsuccessful. 
I've never met anyone that says, I want to lose, I don't want to win. I've never met anyone that says, I'm okay with being mediocre. Everyone, if you ask them, hey, what, go to any commencement of high school, kindergarten, college. Oh, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to win the world. I'm going to do great things. But the reason they settle in is because, because they are trying to do this on their own. And so they, so they say, okay, well, well, my point is, however successful you want to be, God has a successful plan for you. However prosperous you want to be, God has a greater plan of prosperity. However great things you want to do in your life, God wants it more. He knows if you will let him do your plan for your life. But here's the thing. However this package deal is, it comes on one prerequisite. That is your repentance. I wish everybody in this church and then another thousand could be here today. I'm telling you, you're hearing from the Lord. I don't mind to tell you that I'm proclaiming the truth. God, got so, he has a lot of things in store, but he can't get it to you until you deal with your sin problem. Your sin and your rebellion can only be dealt with by your decision. He can't do that for you. That could be a roof. Could just be an absolute caving in in your faith. But whatever it is, let's get out the hammer. Let's get out the saw. Let's get out the crowbar. Let's get out the ladder and climb on the roof. Come on, somebody. And let's get there and start pulling everything out that is standing between me and Jesus and trashing it and getting rid of it and saying, you know what? I've come for a touch. Did you come for a touch? Did you come for a touch? Did you come for a touch? You, you came to this front row. Did you come because you need a touch? You need God to heal you? You need the supernatural? Let me tell you what's going to happen. I've written down about 10, about 10 things that bears out what we are about to do. And by stretching your hand to heal them, signs and wonders will be done. Is there any sick among you? Call the elders of the church and let them anoint them and lay hands on them. You'll take up serpents and you will drink any deadly thing and they will not be by no means hurt you. You lay hands on the sick and they recover. Acts 28 and 8, as it happened, they lay hands on her and she was completely healed of her fever and dysentery. Matthew 9 and 8, and while he spoke these things, the ruler came, he laid hands on the daughter, she was healed and brought to life. And the beggar, and he begged him, Mark 5 and 30, my little daughter lies at the point of death. Come, lay your hands on her and she will be healed. No one could do mighty works except he laid hands on them. They laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. They fasted and prayed, they laid hands on them. Do not neglect this gift that's in you, but it's given by the laying on of hands. There is something that happens when you and I come in agreement with God's word. Today, a servant of the Lord is going to lay hands on you. And when you get hands laid on you, you're going to be made whole. Hallelujah. Woo. I had a service plan. I had a thing plan, all these things. But I promise you what God wants to do this is just if he has to bring a snowstorm to get a hold of me and say, you know, go in another direction, he'll do that because he cares about you that much. Whew. You on the front row, I want you to stand. Everyone standing. I want us to sing, um, I believe you're my healer. Now, I want to talk to all of you who are on the front row. And I want to tell you, you are not alone. Now, I want to talk to all of you who are not on the front row. If you're not on the front row right now, raise your hand, identify that you realize that. Okay. With your hand raised, say, I know I'm not on the front row. Right. The Bible says, when Jesus saw their faith, not, not the guy on the bed's faith. His friend's faith. So here's what we got to understand. These folks are very weak. They're sick. They're under attack. They're not well. Some of them have a seasonal thing they're dealing with. For some, it's more. It's been long term. 
some are under a varying amount of stress in their health. And they don't need to tear the roof off. That's what we're for. What do you think? Amen. They're doing like good friends. I mean, there have been times I've been too weak to call out. And you called out for me. And you helped me. That's what the body of Christ is for. And all of you on the front row, when God touches you, I want you to do everything you can, but understand, we're going to help you with your roof. We're going to help you. Woo, hallelujah. I said, hallelujah. Does anybody feel the Holy Ghost in this house today? I feel him. Oh, God. You and I, our faith matters. Our faith matters. Could it be when you gather around these friends and you begin to pray over them that God's going to see your faith and they're going to be the recipient of the supernatural? Hi, my Lord, have mercy. We need to move, okay? All of you that are on this front row, I want you to step forward go all the way from that door to that door. About a foot from this gray carpet are the green stripe. I want four friends to gather around each of them. Just give enough room for Kathy and me. Let's spread out. Everybody can spread out a little bit. Four friends. Everybody needs to move. Come on. Don't stand back. Move quickly. Act like you need a miracle and you're going to help them. Come on, church. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Come. We're waiting. We want four gals with a gal, four men with the men. That gives you enough room for Kathy and me just to come in front. 